Hello and welcome back. This is the week 10 lecture. So this is a big day for us, kind of an important week, because this is the beginning of our research paper unit. So we've been talking a lot about the argumentative research paper this semester. I've been kind of previewing various things that we're going to be doing uh, with the research papers and of course a lot of our previous assignments were getting us ready they were designed to prepare us for the research paper but now we are actually beginning our work on assembling uh, these papers and it's going to be a process I really do want you guys to think about this as a long-term process. We're not going to build these research papers in a single week or two weeks. It's going to take longer than that. So the process starts here today in week 10 and it continues really all the way until the end of the semester. So uh, this is what we're doing for the rest of the semester. You will be turning in your completed bibliographies in a few weeks and we do have a research paper proposal that will be coming in pretty soon but that's just so I can sign off on everybody's approach to the research paper so those are obviously uh, sort of connected uh, very much connected to the research paper the proposal is just my chance to make sure that you're on the right track and the finished bibliography is just showing me that you've done all of your research so our focus really is pretty much exclusively on the research paper from now on so what that really means for us is we have to adjust our focus a little bit we've spent the last few weeks really looking hard at our sources <laughs> working on summarizing paraphrasing quoting our sources synthesizing and analyzing our sources obviously the rhetorical analysis that you just turned in gave you a chance to demonstrate some of those skills so we've been working with our sources a lot hopefully by now you guys are comfortable with your sources you are comfortable with the research topic that you chose you've learned a lot about it uh, and now it's time to really start developing our own arguments so we're still going to use those sources. Let's not forget about them. Let's not forget all the work that we've done with them. But now we need to start developing original arguments of our own. So we've been identifying our author's arguments. We've been looking for our author's main claims, big ideas, main points. And that is really good practice. That's a good rehearsal now that you are taking on the role. Each one of you will be taking on the role of author. Uh, each one of you will be writing your own original argument. So all of that stuff that we've been looking for in our sources, now it's time that we start developing those things for ourselves. So the time has come to get argumentative. I know we've been thinking about potential arguments by now hopefully you have a position or a series of opinions about your research topic based on the reading that you've done uh, the previous work that we've done so now we really need to figure out exactly where we stand and what kind of argument about our topic we want to make and obviously we're going to be using our sources as support. We're going to be using those sources to illustrate our points, to provide examples. But the points need to be ours. Most of the big ideas in the paper need to come from each individual author. Uh, for in each one of your papers, I mean. Uh, so you as the author, you need to be the leading voice in your research paper. The thesis obviously needs to be yours. The argument is yours. It might be similar to some of the arguments that you've seen over the course of your research, but you need to find a way to make it unique to you. You need to find some kind of an original spin. These need to be original arguments. And most of the supporting points, most of the main ideas that you're going to be developing over the course of the paper, those are going to be yours. Uh, 
And then when it comes to inartistic appeals, a lot of the best kinds of evidence, that's coming from your sources. And again, the sources give you sort of general support, but the argument, the position, and the big ideas, those need to be yours. So starting this week, we need to start developing original claims. Claims are really important when we start working on the research paper. We need a lot of these. And we also need to know the basic difference between an original claim and a statement of fact. Okay, so students sometimes get these two things mixed up. Uh, an original claim is debatable and somewhat controversial. Okay, that's the key. When we're thinking about claims, they are by definition debatable or controversial, which means not everybody is going to agree with a claim that you make. And that's the whole point. A claim is a position. It's a viewpoint. Um, it's often going to be supported by fact and evidence. So we don't always necessarily label it strictly as an opinion, but it is something that is debatable. Not everybody agrees. That's what makes it a claim. Now, on the other, on the other hand, a statement of fact is different. A statement of fact is a true statement. It is factually true, factually accurate, but it's so obviously true and it's so easy to prove that we really can't have a debate about it, at least not a very interesting or long debate. So let me give you an example. A statement of fact would be something like this. I am recording this lecture at home in my apartment on the afternoon of Thursday, March 31st, okay? That is a factual statement. It's true. Now, some people might want to argue with me about that statement, but the argument or the debate, it's not go going to proceed. It's not going very far because I can prove it. <laughs> uh, I can prove where I was. Uh, the video itself, I think, has some kind of timestamp that I could show people as proof of when it was recorded. I could prove that this is, in fact, my home, that you are seeing my kitchen, to be more exact. Um, so that's not a debate. That's not an interesting controversy that we can explore and pursue. It's just a factual statement. People might disagree uh, initially, but I can prove it and the debate is not going anywhere. But what about a statement or a claim like this? Uh, watching recorded lectures is just as effective for students as live in-class lectures would be. So the effectiveness level of the two lecture, of the two types of lecture, is the same. There's no difference for students. Okay, so I'm not phrasing that very elegantly, but if I put that in an original sentence, uh, lecture recordings are just as effective as live in-class recordings for students. That's a claim. That's debatable. Not everybody is going to agree with me. Uh, plenty of other teachers, plenty of students will disagree and say, no, lectures are more effective in the classroom when everybody's together and the teacher is physically present. Uh, so there's lots of different positions that people can take on this issue or this topic that I am tapping into here. But notice that my claim is me staking out a position. I am claiming that lecture recordings are just as effective as traditional lectures. That's my position. That is an argumentative stance that I am taking, okay? Because not everybody is going to agree with me. Plenty of other people will make counterpoints. They will make opposing arguments. So we can have a debate. We can, uh, we can argue. We can go back and forth and present our evidence and... The audience, in the case of these papers, uh, the audience can decide uh, which argument is best. So that's what we want. Uh, we want claims that can result in debates. We like 
debates in this current context. I know some of us don't think of ourselves as being very argumentative. We don't really seek out conflict. We don't like to argue maybe in our everyday lives. And that's fine. <laughs> that probably makes you a pretty pleasant person. But uh, on these papers, you need to be argumentative. You don't have to be unpleasant. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to attack other people. But you do need to be confident in your position. You need to be confident in your claims. And we need a lot of claims uh, over the course of our paper. And of course, our biggest claim is going to be our thesis, our central claim, our sort of overarching uh, biggest overall claim. That's going to be our thesis. That's going to be the moment early in the paper where we basically articulate our overall argument. The thesis might be sort of a generalized, uh, somewhat simplified version of your overall argument. And you're presenting it, you're announcing it in that first paragraph and then you're of the research paper and we'll talk more about that about our structure our outline when, once we start outlining uh but you're going to want you know announce your overall argument early in the paper and then you develop it over the course of your body paragraphs so your biggest claim will be the thesis but you also need other claims you need related claims that can function as supporting points uh, you're going to be developing a lot of these supporting points in your body paragraphs. And obviously, they all need to connect back to the thesis. They are all sort of supporting the thesis. But they are ways that you can get into more detail. You can get more in-depth. You can offer evidence, examples, and all of the other things that will make the overall argument work. So... We're going to be building all of that stuff later, but for now, you just need to know that you need a lot of claims. So we have a fun sort of exercise that we can use today to start developing claims. And really, uh, we're just writing claims down right now. We can write them in complete sentences. These can be fragments at the current moment. These can be bullet points. Uh, we are pre-writing right now. So I mentioned the writing process earlier. Hopefully you guys uh, remember a little bit about the writing process from 101. You're supposed to kind of talk about it in 101. Uh, we haven't talked about it a whole lot here, but uh, there's three basic stages, pre-writing, drafting, and post-writing. A lot of students want to skip right to drafting. That's when you actually sit down to write the paper. But pre-writing is everything that you do before you start writing. So that includes outlining. Um, that includes, in some cases, research and some of the summaries that you're writing, some of the synthesis stuff that you're doing with your sources. But it also includes just really basic what we call like idea generation activities. Even before you can start outlining, you have to just generate ideas, just get some ideas and some claims down on paper. And at this point, it can be very informal, very rough. We are just brainstorming. We are getting ideas down on paper. That's a staple of early pre-writing. First, we like to keep it loose and relaxed, and we just like to get stuff down on paper. Uh, we call this brainstorming. In some cases, it's called a free write, where you just write nonstop for 10 or 15 minutes about your topic and see what you come up with. So I like all of that stuff, but today I'm going to give you a, a, a slightly more structured idea generation activity that we can use to come up with more claims. So we're going to be using something called the topoi today. And like a lot of aspects of rhetoric and argumentation, this comes down from the ancient Greeks and Aristotle. So topoi is, is, is a Greek word for places. And they literally referred to places in the mind. That's how the ancient Greeks thought of them. So these are kind of like logical shortcuts that are designed to produce logical arguments. Uh, and they do that by sort of allowing the arguer to access information. 
That's really what the topoi are about. Uh, they're a series of questions that you ask yourself about your topic. And your answers to these questions will allow you to sort of discover information or at least get information written down. It might be stuff that you already know, but it's just like in your head or it's in some source that you read. Now you can get that stuff written down. You can kind of get it all in one place and you might be able to use some of that info later and hopefully in the process of using the topoi you're able to come up with some claims some of your answers to these questions might actually be claims that can later appear in your paper so aristotle actually had two categories of topoi he had the common topoi you know common places the, uh, that's actually what we're using these are more general topoi um, and they're used to come up with arguments really about anything. Uh, that's the whole idea of being general. That's why we like them, because I know all of you have different topics. So it doesn't matter what field of study uh, you are working within. It does not matter what your topic is. Uh, the commonplaces or the general topoi will give you some things to work with. He also had what he called the uh, sort of special topoi, um, which were more specific. The special places were more specific, uh, and usually they were used to discover specialized knowledge in a particular area. And we're not really doing that. Uh, so we're sticking with the general topoi, so anybody can use them. Anybody in the class, no matter what your topic is, you can make use of the general topoi. So there's a whole bunch of general or common topoi. We're only going to use six because these should give us some material to work with. Uh, it's at least a way to get started. You're not going to use everything that you write down today as we run through the topoi, but even if you use half of it, even if you use a quarter of it, that's still valuable. You're still starting the writing process. So just a quick rundown as to how this works, okay? So I would kind of like you guys to, to do some of this while you're watching. So I'm going to run through all of the topoi, at least the six that we are using, and these are in the week 10 overview. So if you don't, if, if you can't do it right now, like if you're driving or something and you can't write, uh, you can always go back later and use the notes in the overview and do this on your own time. But if you have... Uh, the opportunity to do it now, it would be good to just start jotting stuff down. Just start answering the questions and then you can start generating claims. So each one of these topoi uh, serves as a question or in some cases multiple questions that will prompt you to discover and sort of examine key information, like I was saying. Uh, and that key info that you write down as sort of your answers to the questions, uh, that key info might either function as an original claim or it at least will give you the raw material that you need to create an original claim. So even if your answers to the questions are not in complete sentences, the information uh, that those answers contain can later be turned into complete polished sentences and you might end up using some of these uh, in your paper. So that's the idea. So I'm going to run through all six of these. Uh, so the first thing you do is just answer the questions that I'm asking. Write down that key information that you need to be able to answer these questions. And then, like I said, we can kind of mold that key info into original claims. Uh, so each one of the original claims that we're writing, you can almost look at it as a mini argument. It's a little 
you know, argumentative claim, might even be a big argumentative claim. It's something that you could develop in the body paragraphs of your paper. Maybe it could serve as a supporting point. Maybe it could serve as one of your main ideas. Remember, we've been looking for all of this stuff in our sources. So just like your sources have one big thesis oftentimes, and then a lot of supporting points, a lot of related ideas that they develop in order to support that thesis, we're doing the same thing. We're taking a, basically the same approach. We need to have that overall argument. That's our biggest claim, but we need some smaller claims that we can develop over the course of our body paragraph. So hopefully, if, you, if this uh, exercise works well for you, you should be able to have one original claim per topoi. Uh, you know, and again, you might toss some of these out later, but even if just a couple of them are useful for you, you're already starting to generate content. And that's just, you know, that's a challenge for some students because the research paper is rather long. <laughs> it's a pretty long paper, longer perhaps than papers we've written before. So we need a lot of original content and this is how we start generating it okay so let's start with uh and again you can run any topic through these topoi it does not matter but please choose your research topic that you've already selected and that you've been working with already throughout the semester don't change topics now please or if you want to uh email me because we need to talk um so using your pre-existing research topic, uh, run it through these six topoi, beginning with number one, the topic of definition. Okay, so here are the questions that you can answer for topoi one, the topoi of definition, the topic of definition. Uh, to what larger group or category does your topic belong? So basically, you're categorizing it here to a certain extent. Like, is there a larger group that you can place your topic within? Uh, and if so, what characteristics or traits does your topic share with the other topics that are in this same larger group or category? So think about really broad categories here, like political issues or the medical industry or, you know, social issues. Like these are examples of broader categories, science and technology related issues. Like where does your topic fall? What larger group does your topic belong to? It's always nice to start by sort of categorizing and defining your topic. Uh, just to kind of get a sense of maybe a larger context that surrounds your topic, but also to start thinking a little bit about similar or related topics. So think about the overall group characteristics that you can observe in whatever group you're putting your topic in. So maybe your topic is related to uh, medicine, some kind of medical issue. So what are some other medical related topics that this might share some things in common with? Uh, what are some commonalities? What are some characteristics that we can maybe identify in a lot of different medical related topics? Just start thinking along those lines. So write down your answers to those questions. So to what group or category does your topic belong? And then what are some of the characteristics of that group? you know, some of the other uh, shared characteristics within that group. So write down your answers. That's going to be your key info, whatever you jot down in response to those questions. And then see if you can come up with an original claim based on that key info. And I'll pause just for a moment for those of you who are doing this right now. But of course, you can also pause me <laughs> and come back or you can just do this later using the notes in the week 10 overview. OK, so moving on, uh, the second topoi is division. 
And this is a really important one. I think everybody should be able to get something out of Topoi number two. So division is all about the individual elements or parts that make up your research topic. So break your topic down into smaller individual parts. Let me give you an example. A student uh, in a previous semester was doing, uh, her topic was childhood obesity. So that was the topic. And when she got to this topoi, she broke it down into the following parts. And she might have had more, but these are just the ones that I can remember and wrote down <laughs> to share in the future. Uh, so some of the individual parts of her topic were nutrition, uh, exercise, uh, both at school and at home, I think, and then serving sizes at restaurants, particularly fast food restaurants. So those were just three parts of her topic, but she knew that she wanted to explore all three of those. So try to do that with your topic. Break it down because our topics are broad, right? Our topics are big. They're kind of general. So let's break them down into sort of uh, smaller pieces, smaller individual parts. And of course, they're all related. Uh, but these are individual parts that you might be able to explore in your bodies, your body paragraphs. So, uh, so the question here to answer is what parts or elements make up your topic? And then... A related question, how do those different parts relate to each other? How do they sort of work together, you know, kind of kind of think about their relationships, the relationships between those individual parts? So uh, write down your answers and then try to come up with an original claim based on those answers. Okay, uh, topoi number three, similarities and differences. So this is some pretty standard comparing and contrasting. We've all done this before in previous classes. So uh, think about how your topic is similar to other topics. So again, go back to topoi number one. Look at the larger group that you assigned your topic to. Okay, what does it have in common with the other topics in that group? But also think about differences. How is this topic different from similar or just other topics, other sort of hot button issues that people are talking about or maybe writing about? You guys can sort of use your general knowledge of the world, even though you don't know what all of your classmates are writing about, you have a pretty good idea of some popular topics. And again, you can look at... Um, uh, the, the, the list of sample topics that I posted weeks ago when we were first choosing topics, uh, you can just look at that list for some examples of common popular topics. So what does your topic have in common with some of those? And then how is it also different from some of those? So think about what you might compare it to or contrast it to. All right, so jot down some key information about that. And once again, try to convert it into an original claim. Debatable. Again, the, the, the way to know if you're working with a claim and not just a statement of fact is to ask yourself a simple question. Could anybody, any reasonable adult, could any reasonable adult argue with me about this statement? And if the answer is yes, <laughs> it's probably a claim. If the answer is no, only a child or only somebody who's like intentionally being difficult would argue with me about this, then it's probably not a claim and you need to keep working. All right. So topoi three was similarity and difference. Topoi number four, another one that I think is very helpful, cause and effect. Okay. So we need to start thinking about cause and effect. What causes your topic to exist? This kind of seems like a strange question at first, but really think about it, especially if your topic is an issue, a problem, 
that you are trying to solve. Chances are something created that problem. Uh, maybe it was people, maybe it was nature, maybe it was groups of people, uh, maybe it was animals, who knows. But what caused your topic to exist? What brought your topic into existence? What created it? Think about that first and jot down an answer. And then think about what effects are caused by your topic. So think about both levels of cause and effect. Really, we need to think about this as a causal chain. You may have heard that term before. A causal chain is an ordered sequence of events in which one event causes the next event to occur. Uh, so kind of place your topic in a larger causal chain. What caused your topic? So what came before your topic? In other words, what caused it? What created it? And then think about what comes after your topic. Think about what comes along as a result of your topic. Okay, so what causes come about because of your topic? Um, or what effects does your topic cause? That's a more clear way of putting it. But what comes about as a result of your topic? What does your topic then create? What does your topic make happen? What uh, transpires uh, as a direct effect of that topic? So by thinking about the causal chain, you can maybe zero in on causes or you might be interested in effects like what your topic is doing to us. Uh, what kinds of effects do we have to deal with maybe in the future? So you can go back in time with causes, or you can look at what your topic is creating after the fact. Uh, or maybe you want to look at both. But by looking at causes and effects, you should be able to come up with at least something that you can make an original claim about. So try to jot down some key info for cause and effect. Maybe even draw out a causal chain. Place your topic on the chain. What comes before it? What comes after? And then write a claim based on that. At least one. Now again, our goal is to have at least one original claim for each topoi. But you're free to write multiple claims for some of these topoi. If you have a lot of ideas, a lot to say... Maybe you have two claims about cause and effect. Maybe three. That's fine. And again, you don't have to be married to all of these claims. You might not end up using them all. But as long as you can use some of them, uh, that's a victory. Okay. Uh, next up, number five, we have the topoi of negation. Negation. So this is also kind of a weird one. But the question to answer here is if a part of or your if a part of your topic or your entire topic was somehow negated or stopped or just like eliminated what would happen what would be the effects of that so this could be I mean, these could be positive effects like if your topic is a social problem that you're trying to fix if we were somehow able to stop whatever that thing is from happening if we negated it if we got rid of it the results would be good. The effects would be positive. Uh, but in some cases, stopping your topic or eliminating it or even just eliminating a part of it, it might actually have negative effects. So just explore that for a few moments. What would happen if part or all of your topic was somehow just negated, gotten rid of? What would happen? So jot something down for that, and you might be able to come up with a good original claim for that one. And then finally, our sixth and final topoi is substitution, a little similar to negation. So if we were to replace your topic with a somewhat similar but different topic, or just if we replaced it with something else, what would happen? What would be the effects of that substitution? Uh, again, would we have positive <laughs> effects or negative? 
So this one's a little tricky. We can't always come up with great claims for substitution, but at least jot down some key info. Think about it. What would be the significance of that substitution? Is there something eligible that we could use as a substitution? In some cases, with some topics, you would probably just say, I can't think of one. (laughs) I might not be able to think of something that we could replace this with. But maybe you can't. And if you can, that potential replacement could be an interesting thing to pursue and think more about. So jot down some key info, do your best with this one, and then try to come up with one final original claim. So once you're finished with the Topoi, you should have six original claims that you might be able to use later on your research paper. And remember, it's not too early to start thinking about your biggest claim, the thesis. We don't have to be fully settled on our thesis yet. Uh, I'm going to want us to be pretty settled by about two weeks from now, by I would say week 12, as we continue to outline over the course of next week and into week 12. Uh, we're going to need to have it. I think your proposals come in in week 12, and you really need to have your argument pretty well hammered out by the time you're turning in your proposal uh, to me. So uh, it's okay if you don't have it quite worked out in your mind right now. But start thinking about it. Start thinking about it. And it's a process. Just like the overall paper is a process, arriving at your thesis statement is a process. You might not get the wording right immediately. Uh, you know, it's never too early to just jot stuff down and look at what you look at what you're writing down for the topoi. Maybe something that you're uh, putting down for one of these topoi. Maybe that could one day be a thesis statement with a lot more work and polishing. But we're going to spend plenty of time on the thesis, so don't worry about that. Okay, so the final thing I want to do today, I mean, think about that, but don't worry about that. So the final thing I want to do today, just to kind of give you a a general impression of what to expect with these research papers, uh, I want to tell you sort of the four main parts of the paper as we do it in this class the way i teach the argumentative research paper it really consists of four units or four parts and i want to get you guys familiar and comfortable with all four of those parts because once we start outlining and planning uh you need to be planning for each one of these parts and they're all going to be asking for different things Uh, You need to perform slightly different moves in each one of these sections or parts. So we need to start getting prepared for that. All right. Uh, So again, these are the main sections, the main components of the research paper. They're not all equal. Uh, They're not all equal in terms of importance or length. As we'll see, one uh, is kind of standing above the others in terms of importance and the time that you'll spend on it. But all four of these sections are important. They're all essential. We can't skip one. We can't leave any one of these out. So we need all of them. They're all performing certain things. They're all allowing us to perform certain functions that are absolutely necessary for the research paper. So as we're brainstorming and free writing and generating ideas, you need to be doing all of that for each one of these sections. But as we'll see, it's going to be relatively easy to do that for some of the sections, and it will be a little more difficult and complex for other sections. So let's start with the easiest one and the shortest one, typically. The first part or section uh, of the research paper will largely consist of facts. Okay. You have to establish some facts about your research paper up front, uh, in your intro paragraph early on. So when we're asking questions of fact, we're asking very basic things like what happened, uh, what exists, what, uh, has already happened and what is happening right now. 
Uh, so facts are often going to be pretty self-explanatory and self-evident, but not always. <laughs> so that's important to keep in mind. Usually, rational people can agree on certain facts, but not always. Facts can be disputed, and we have to remember that facts can change over time. Uh, new discoveries are made. New technological breakthroughs occur. Uh, and as we discover and learn more, we have to constantly update uh, our, our existing knowledge as, as new things come to light. So yes, over time, some facts do change. Or at least they get kind of revised a little bit, updated a little bit. So there can be some debate. But typically, facts are uh, pretty self-evident, and most people can agree about them. So what you have to do at the very beginning of your research paper is establish some basic facts about your topic. <laughs> what is it? Uh, tell us what exists. Tell us what has happened. You might have to fill us in on some noteworthy recent events. Uh, like recent legislation that may have been passed, uh, maybe some kind of crime or noteworthy event that spurred some kind of change. Uh, you might have to give us a very brief history, uh, tell us some things that recently happened. You might have to simply establish the basic parameters of your topic. This is the problem. Uh, this is what it consists of. This is roughly how long it's been a problem. Uh, and this is how it's transpiring right now in our present moment. So the facts, like I said, are pretty easy and you don't spend a whole lot of time on this. Mostly, most of your sort of uh, big, most important facts are going to get established in the intro paragraph pretty quickly, like in your first few sentences. So as you're introducing your topic, you're also establishing some basic facts about that topic. You're not really getting into your argument yet. These facts are meant to <laughs> sort of be consensus uh, more or less. You know, these are things that most people are going to agree on. So you can have some statements of fact early in that intro paragraph. You're just establishing some basic things about your topic. Things that we need to know. That's important to keep in mind. Don't just give us a ton of facts for the sake of taking up space. You're not Wikipedia. You just need to give us the facts that are essential to your argument. The facts that are essential uh, to your readers having a basic understanding of your topic and your readers to then understand your argument. Uh, so you want to stick to only the facts that are necessary for you to accomplish your goals. Um, so again, for us, a fact is going to be a frequently repeated idea or point that most people agree to be true. <laughs> uh, and there can be some dispute sometimes, but generally the facts are going to be the non-controversial, the non-debatable part of our paper and we like to lead with those because we need to establish the topic very clearly so everybody knows exactly what we are talking about all right so the next big section that comes after the intro paragraph and of course you do establish your thesis in the intro paragraph but you're just kind of announcing it you're getting us ready to get into it and the next thing you do is not quite argumentative yet. The next part is definition. And this will typically be the second paragraph that you write in the research paper. We typically have a definition paragraph that on one level does the obvious thing that the name implies. It is defining certain concepts, certain terms, certain ideas that, once again, are important to your topic. And these are things that your readers need to understand. So don't just think about this like strictly defining words. You're also defining larger concepts. You might even be sort of defining events or people, just in the sense that you're explaining why they're important. 
you're telling us a little bit more about them. So in a lot of a lot of ways, this is a continuation of the facts that you've already established in the intro paragraph because you're keeping those brief. When we get to the definition paragraph, you're giving us a little bit more detail. You're giving us, you know, terminology, additional facts, or just some things that we need to know. People we need to know, events that we need to know, maybe specific terms or concepts that we need to know. And you're going to be explaining this stuff and sort of giving us all of the info that we need to be able to then jump into your argument. So this can be a little tricky. The facts you should largely have. So the facts, I would recommend starting on the facts section whenever you have some free time because it's not going to be super challenging. You just need to write a few sentences introducing your topic and establishing those basic facts about it. You've already seen all of that. You've already come across those facts. You've read them and a lot of them might have already made their way into some of your previous work. The definition paragraph though, it takes a little more time, but you might be ready to start working on it now. So if you're working in the medical field, there's going to be some terms, uh, maybe some occupations or some specialized knowledge that you will need to explain to audiences, especially if that stuff pertains directly to your topic. Uh, so that's true for most for most topics. If it falls in more of like a science technology realm, there's going to be some things that we need to know. Uh, if it falls in education or it's just like a big social issue, uh, there's always going to be stuff unique to that topic that regular people, you know, a, a general audience might not know. So the definition paragraph is finishing the job that we started by establishing basic facts. We're just giving our readers what they need in order to jump into our argument. So our argument comes next. <laughs> That's the third part. So we call this the quality or the support section. Uh, and this is just your argument. In other words, this is where you are developing and supporting the argument that you announced in that intro paragraph. So this is where the bulk of the work gets done. So this third section really consists of most of your body paragraphs. The majority of the bodies that you write will fall in this third section. So this is where most of our evidence is going to be on display. This is where most of our original content will be on display. Our own views, our own positions, the support provided by our sources, the artistic appeals that we generate ourselves, and the inartistic appeals that we're largely getting from our sources. All of that stuff is going to be found in the third section. That's where you're doing a little bit of summarizing, a little bit of paraphrasing, little bit of quoting, but also inserting your own original points, uh, developing your own original claims. So we'll spend a lot of time on the quality and support section. And then finally, the fourth section, the final section is policy. And this is really important. We're not quite ready to work on it yet. I just want you to write it down and maybe start thinking about it a little bit. This is what we end with. The policy will often be sort of uh, described in your final body paragraph or maybe even in your concluding paragraph. But the policy is basically your recommendation as to what needs to be done to sort of implement your argument or to fix the problem or the issue that you're identifying. So one thing that we're going to find to be true here is that a lot of us are probably making what we call policy-based arguments. So in other words, your thesis kind of is your policy in some cases. Like if you're trying to address a social problem, uh, your argument might basically consist of steps that we can take to fix the problem, potential solutions to the problem. And that's fine. Uh, some of us will actually be developing our policy throughout our body paragraphs. So for, for those of you who fall in that camp, you won't have to spend a ton of additional time on your policy at the end of the paper. 
you can just kind of return to the policy a little bit in the conclusion and maybe offer a little bit more detail, a little bit more in the way of specifics. So not not you're not only recommending what actions need to be taken to solve whatever problem or issue you're addressing, you're also talking about who needs to take the steps, who needs to take the action. Are we talking about politicians, like regular people, people working within certain professions? Who needs to take the action? Whose responsibility is it? Uh, you know, which actors are taking these actions and who needs to take the lead role? So you can get into a lot of specifics depending on topic and, and argument, but you might be getting into some money concerns, like how much is this going to cost? Who's going to be responsible? Is this going to be a government program? Is it going to be uh, independently owned? All of that kind of stuff, you can sort it out when you're talking policy. So if, you're, if your overall argument or thesis isn't exactly all that policy related, then you can have kind of a standalone policy at the end of your body paragraphs. And you might develop that policy over the course of, like I said, your final body or maybe your last two bodies. And then you can wrap it up along with everything else in your conclusion. But if you've been already kind of developing that policy throughout your bodies, you can just wrap it up in the conclusion and that's probably it. So there's different ways to approach it, but everybody must have a policy and it must be made clear by the end of your paper. So we have plenty of time to work on that. You really need to be clear on your argument first. Uh, you you got to have the thesis statement, at least, you know, some, you have to be, feel at least somewhat comfortable with it, good about it. And then once you have that thesis in mind, you can decide, hey, is that a policy? And if not, what's the policy that I would recommend based on this argument? You'll be able to come up with it at that point. So we have plenty of time. We don't need to worry about policy yet, but that is the fourth and final section that we will need to plan eventually. All right, so please work with the Topoi this week. This week is all about generating claims. So this week's research journal is just asking you to list some of the claims that you came up with during the Topoi exercise. But by the time you're doing the research journal, uh, you should have worked with these claims a little bit. They need to be complete sentences. They need to sound pretty good. Make sure they are punctuated correctly. Make sure they look good, sound good, and you might be able to use them later. Okay, get in touch with me if you have any questions about topics, research, the topoi, the research paper in general. Uh, I look forward to hearing from some of you soon. We're going to have to talk at some point when we have our conferences, but if, you're, if you have questions, or if you have concerns, just email me. And otherwise, I will see you next week.